Um, so I should have slides. So if the, the text, um, there we go. Perfect. Um, great. So my name is Lisa Kosha from the World Resources Institute, and uh, my work has focused on understanding where and when conflicts over water resources issues will occur. Um, and we created an early warning system so that key actors can engage in early intervention and conflict prevention. So next slide, please. Great. Um, so we're using the armed conflict location event data um, as our outcome data set. So these are the events that we're trying to predict these kind of conflicts. Um, so ACLED collects information about political violence and protest events. Um, and the table to your right uh, in yellow shows the, the different conflict events that we're trying to predict. So battles, explosions, remote violence, um, violence against civilians, riots and protests. Um, next slide, please. Great, so to uh, provide a brief summary of our model, um, we're predicting conflicts over the next 12 months, and we define conflicts as um, at least 10 deaths over the next 12 months. We're using machine learning, so we're learning from over a decade of past patterns, um, and we allow the model to decide like which data sets are helpful to use. Um, we're creating high resolution projections, so you can see um, that we use the ADM2 level, which is um, in blue for the Ethiopia example, in the United States, that's the county level. So one level smaller than the state. Um, we're creating quarterly updates and we generate a report of places to watch. So really um, places that might be at risk. Um, we have clear open methodology so you can you know, read our technical notes, see how we did what we're doing. Um, and our model includes real time climate and water related variables. So next slide, please. So our machine learning model um, showed that many of the 80 different indicators that we tried have significant value in predicting conflicts. Um, you can see that, you know, this is a list of indicators in order of importance. And, and obviously, you know, your local population count and density and previous history of conflicts are going to be, you know, very predictive in future conflicts. Um, but we're also seeing in the blue and the green some water and food indicators who are also successful in predicting future conflicts. Um, I want to note that this is only predictive power, not causation, but I'll come back to that later. Next slide, please. So our model is able to predict 86% of all conflicts. So you can see the different bars. The yellow bars are where our models predicted emerging conflict, and the blue bars are where we predicted ongoing conflict. Um, and you'll see that you know, between 50 and 70% is often where emerging conflict is, and we usually do predict that that will be emerging conflict. We do over predict in a lot of these areas, um, and we don't really see that as a problem because we want our global model to be a screening tool. So we, we don't wanna miss any locations, um, So which is why we do over predict. Um, but our ongoing conflict predictions, pretty right on, so pretty accurate. Um, next slide, please. So we've designed a tool to communicate results based on user recommendations. Um, and you can see here that the tool's homepage shows a forecast of conflicts for like the next 12 months. Um, next slide, please. Perfect, thanks. Um, and on the tool, so users can select other data sets that were predictors or show important contextual information, such as like droughts measured by the standardized precipitation index. Next slide, please. Uh, we can also look at how crop health is progressing and how, how crops are progressing in a season using uh, evapotranspiration anomalies. Next slide, please. We can also check out previous conflicts using the ACLA data. Next slide, please. Um, and displacement um, of, of populations due to conflict and natural disasters. Next slide, please. Um, so we can also understand a little bit more about what's going on in, in those local regions around the world. Um, so we can understand if you know population is growing and that might put more pressure on certain regions. Next slide, please. Uh, we can also look to see if there's a stronger or more competitive economy with increase in GDP. Next slide, please. Um, great. So with our global tool, you can ID hotspots of conflict and water challenges. Um, you can compare 
the data across regions and it explored the underlying data that went into the model or is contextual data. Um, from there, you can conduct local analysis and engagement. And we definitely encourage you to do that local analysis um, as the global model is a screening tool. Um, next slide, please. So we, um, we launched our initial model, uh, but we're not done yet. We're working on improving our forecasting model. Um, we're working on understanding that causal relationship. Right now, our model is strictly predictive, but it can't explain causal, uh, um, causal relationships. Um, so we're really working on that causation. We're adding different high value data sets um, and switching out which, which data sets are included in our model. And we're improving the communication of our results through updates to the tool. Um, next slide, please. So thank you for letting me take you through a whirlwind tour of our tool. Um, and please do take a look at this QR code or waterpeacesecurity.org uh, to check out our current forecast. And um, we look forward to hearing your feedback. So thank you. Thank you, Liz. That was really great. And um, following this, we have our first Slido poll for you. Um, we would like to launch now the Slido poll. Um, about this presentation that Liz just gave. And let's ask you, what community do you feel needs, to, needs this tool most? For who is this? So for the development community, for the diplomacy community, for defense, or for disaster risk reduction? It's hard to choose, I know, but if you can please click on Slido, your choice, which one you feel is best for this tool. And then while you are, uh, thinking about this, I'd like to go back to where we started at the beginning of the session and uh, introduce uh, Professor Aaron Wolf. Um, luckily, he's now with us. I'm really happy. I didn't want to miss this uh, part of the session. And as I said, he's been the long-standing expert on these issues, especially at transboundary level, transboundary stakeholder cooperation and peace building. And um, as I said, Professor Aaron Wolf is um, professor at IHC Delft, the lead agency of WPS, but also geography professor at Oregon State University in the US. Um, Aaron, could you please give us some background on how transboundary watershed conflicts and local conflicts um, work and how data could help in this context? Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Roline, and, and thanks to the uh, hosts for um, inviting me. Uh, it's a very unique uh, uh, setting, and, and trying to come in uh, prevented its challenges, but uh, I appreciate everybody working uh, to make this happen. So um, it actually makes sense. Uh, what Liz was, was talking about, figuring out uh, early warning on the ground, uh, we know in the water world that all water is related through the hydrologic cycle. And when it falls, it absolutely ignores all of our um, international boundaries, uh, our sectoral boundaries. It ignores uh, flowing across stakeholder boundaries. Um, and at the international level, uh, we have some 310 uh, transboundary uh, watersheds, uh, basins that are shared by two or more countries, and another 700 uh, shared aquifers, groundwater units. And that's half the land surface of the Earth. It's more than 40% of the world's population. 80% of water originates in basins that are shared by two or more countries. And so simply to manage water, we need to be able to to cooperate across boundaries in order to manage the real challenges that uh, water management uh, faces, even letting alone uh, development challenges and climate change, um, all of the things that, uh, that uh, increase the risks to uh, water management, uh, we're faced with, with uh, needing to, to manage the, the water across boundaries. So we, we've done a lot of work thinking about uh, conflict and cooperation, specifically in these international basins. And uh, a, a, about a three-year study trying to figure out what the indicators were of conflict. And of course, we always see the big 
headlines. Uh, when somebody builds a dam, maybe now Ethiopia is building the Grand Renaissance Dam and it creates tension downstream in the Nile, uh, in, in the Mekong uh, Basin, either China or Laos, uh, is developing a project that creates some concern in the basin. And so this is when usually the headlines uh, blare and the uh, political decision makers start to get involved. Uh, but beyond the headlines, we were interested in a mu much more systematic assessment of what the triggers are. And we assumed, like everybody, that it's scarcity or it's development or it's inequities or it's uh, uh, lack of, of uh, uh, sewage uh, facilities. And, and we did this three-year study where we, in the end, uh, figured out that the biggest uh, key to conflict versus cooperation was the institutional capacity in the basin. How do I mean that? Basins constantly are fluctuating in all of these variabilities. Uh, supplies are going up and, and down. Demands are going up and down. Inequity, uh, justice, uh, scarcity, floods, droughts, all of these things are happening. But if you have strong institutions to manage that change, you don't end up uh, spilling over into conflict. And what this means is along with trying to get more water to more people and to healthier ecosystems, we also need to be having better conversations earlier to craft the treaties and the river basin organizations and the solid relations that we need to manage these changes within a basin. So if we understand that, we now ha can do early warning at the international level, looking for where somebody wants to build something and there's no capacity for dealing with the changes that are, come, that are about to come about. So at the international scale, we're very comfortable that we know how to uh, assess uh, for potential conflict. And we've learned that not only is there conflict potential, but all of the things that conflict bring resources and attention and, and press and uh, uh, international focus, all of these things also help promote dialogue, uh, better relations, uh, more cooperation that might even spill beyond the water sector into uh, what we call environmental peace building or environmental diplomacy. So we know this at the international scale. The problem is, as Liz pointed out, the international scale is connected intricately to the local scale. And that's where it just, for us, gets too complicated. And what we need to be doing is thinking much more about that relationship between what happens within a country and how that impacts international relations and vice versa so that we can identify even within a country better uh, what are the early warnings, what are the risks, and how can we use that stress in order to enhance dialogue and build the, the conversations and the relationships and the institutions that end up making us all more resilient. Thank you, and that is beautiful, how to build the conversations. I really like that, and I want to keep that uh, with me, that uh, sentence. Um, now, we've done the poll, and uh, I think we can close it now. Um, I hope you all had a chance to, uh, to make your vote, and I'm really curious what is coming out of it. So, what community do you feel? We just heard about um, you know, international relations and the importance of uh, institutions and dialogue among people. So who can use this data tool to enhance that? Um, can we see the outcome? Ah, there it is. Um, so we see that um, most people feel this is really relevant for the development world. So for developing um, social, uh, institutional, or economic uh, development in the country. Um, a large part of you also feels it's important for disaster risk reduction, 43%. A few think this is relevant for diplomacy. And actually, interesting, nobody felt this is really relevant for the defense sector. So that is a, a very interesting uh, uh, outcome. And I'd really like to also uh, learn the views of uh, Liz and Aaron on this, uh, on this part, um, because you've discussed this with many people. Liz, um, 
How does that link to, to your expectation with the tool, who you feel you're making it for? Sure. So I, we, we do think that we're making the tool for those four primary audiences. So it is surprising to see that um, defense isn't, isn't something, um, isn't a use case that many people see. Um, we have been working with um, different groups that are involved in defense and, and national security and, and, and seeing that, you know, maybe if we're preventative over these issues before conflict occurs, that, that can really solve so many of your issues. So um, I do encourage those defense professionals out there to take a look and, and think of conflict uh, prevention through, through intervention um, in water resources as well. Thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, defense often is uh, not so much about prevention in advance. It would be very useful, possibly, if they would include that. Um, Aaron, any views, any reflections from your side on this outcome? Who do you think yeah, no, the I'm, tools I'm not surprised. I think um, thinking about them separately is, is, uh, is one way to do that. But I, I think what, what you, Rolene, have, have spent a lot of time also encouraging is that we think about these together. Uh, when, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State here, she talked about the three Ds of defense, development, and diplomacy. Um, th thinking about them as a, as a collective where uh, attention might be paid to any one in order, in order to bolster all three. And now, of course, disaster risk reduction. And, and I would echo uh, Liz's um, call for uh, the defense folks who are here uh, to be able to think about this. Oftentimes, they just have way better satellites and remote sensing capacity. And when they put those resources to peaceful use and to preventative use and to thinking about um, identifying disputes before they happen, I think it's to everybody's benefit. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, now we've looked at um, how we can warn early and how at the international level uh, we need to strengthen collaboration and cooperation. But of course, as both Liz and Aaron pointed out, it gets very complex and reality is there at the local level. And that's why I'm really happy we have Umar Arbi among us, who is working at the local level as a program manager for International Alert and uh, works with communities on peace building and conflict resolution. And exactly in this very complex context where everything comes together, all the factors, not just water, but all the other tensions that affect people and how to deal with that and how can data tools help you on the ground with you know, preventing conflict escalation and peace building. Um, Umar, I hope you can ex explain a little bit more of those experiences that you have with us. All right. Thank you very much for organizing this. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, I'm going to quickly give a little bit of background on the Mali, the Mali uh, context. As you know, 80% of the, the Mali's population depend on agriculture, primarily at the subsistence level. Water, which is a key to refurbish and develop ecosystems, that are uh, the, the center of the economic activity in Mali and West Africa. So in, in, the, in the Niger Delta region where the WPS program is being implemented, implemented is of course the biggest wet, wetlands in, in West Africa. Its ecosystem is then organized according to seasonal uh, floods and uh, that, the, that regenerates fields and replenish ponds and, and fish stocks. Geographically, standing at the borders of the Sahelian and, and Saharan climatic zones, the, that space, the Inner Niger Delta's uh, ecosystem faces, as you know, several challenges that are linked to water intake variability. First of all, we have the climate change through unpredictable uh, rainfalls and increased evaporation due to temperature rates, and also uh, reduced inflow of water due to combined effects and, and bad management uh, and increased upstream, of course, of, of water use. Um, uh, and one of the biggest threats uh, is an increased resource use due to a growing population, as you know, uh, that leads to pressure uh, on, on ecosystems which affect local communities' means of survival and, and livelihoods. Uh, now, talking about the hot spots and in a community and, and governance threats uh, associated with the with, with this. Uh, as a result, uh, gender and different communities are, are, are affected differently by these uh, stresses 
But the general pattern is that stress on resources challenge traditional resources allocation mechanism that maintained by traditional leaders who are losing their legitimacy. So this puts uh, definitely a strain on the relationship between uh, the three main actors, uh, uh, you know, exploiting the resources in the Indian Niger Delta region. Uh, um, we have the fishermen, the, farm, the farmers, the agricultural farmers, and the cattle uh, herders. Uh, the isolation of, of, of a region which is partially flooded half of the year, coupled with, um, you know, a weak governance and judicial system like, like in Mali, and, and, and marred with ethnic tensions has made a self haven for uh, Islamic militants um, and other armed groups, non-state non, non armed groups that cultivate resentment towards a state that is being, uh, uh, like the Mali state that has been, uh, been perceived as corrupt and uh, not delivering support to its population. Uh, existing uh, land rights, pastoral list uh, chapter and fishery legislations, those documents that uh, really, uh, uh, you know, regulate uh, those activities exist on paper, but they, they remain to be implemented. Uh, the combined loss of confidence in both formal and traditional authorities mm. and, and strain on livelihood uh, have allowed uh, for, for Islamic group of militants to promote alternative systems and gain traction also in neighboring communities, na neighboring countries like Nigeria and, and Burkina Faso. So from the source of uh, the, the Nile in Guinea to downstream countries in Niger, uh, we model dashboards that present implications of the management of dams uh, for, for the Indian Niger Delta uh, areas. Now I'm talking about the recommendations that we have uh, towards the, the European Union and what role for, for the tool that uh, my colleagues just described. Uh, with this uh, background information in mind, uh, the tools developed by the WPS partnership can help at two levels. We have the participatory system analysis uh, that can support uh, our peace building efforts conducted at different levels together with experts, technicians, and, and different water users. It will, in one hand, help restore, tr uh, restore trust among different communities by providing a, a, a space um, you know, for, discuss, uh, for discussion uh, about challenges and identify concrete actions and locally owned solutions around the management of water resources. Because what we, International Alert, is in charge uh, of within uh, the WPS partnership is also to engage, uh, you know, different actors, local communities and authorities uh, into discussions pertaining to peace and security. So on the other hand, the tool can restore also uh, between populations and local authorities as technical agencies uh, need to prove that they can support communities and answer the needs. So applying the tool, the WPS tool can help, the global tool can help uh, support Malian authorities, for example, to promote uh, more inclusive in the uh, war management. It can also enhance coordination of state agencies engaged on these issues, such as the Ministry of War, for example, or the Ministry of Environment, Agriculture, Civil Protection, Peace and Reconciliation. So decisions around natural resource policy, development plans, or investment in infrastructure need to be informed and tested at some point. So the data set presented in the global tool, the dashboard, as well as innovative tools such as the, the agent-based uh, modeling can support development actors, investors, and authorities to best uh, to test their plan and therefore increase the conflict sensitivity of, uh, of their decision. So uh, decision, uh, I mean, deciders and policy makers need to avoid uh, negative impact of the programs by adopting a risks and conflict sensitivity perspective. Development policies, for example, such as the, the multi-annual indicative plan or the neighborhood development and international cooperation instrument that is currently under development need to adopt a conflict sensitive approach. And this is what we are really striving to, to do within this, uh, this partnership. So in the, for example, in the uh, Neighborhood Development and International Cooperation Instrument, uh, one of the sub branch of the green economy pillars focuses on renewable energies and natural resource management. Interventions in war related plants need to be definitely sensitive sensitive, I mean, to, to, local, uh, to, to, to local population's concern. And finally, another possible idea would be uh, maybe to focus on implementation of these existing legislations, as I, as I said at the beginning. Uh, they do exist, but they, they are yet to be implemented. So those plans 
such as the restoration and conservation of biodiversity and natural resources uh, of the Inner Niger Delta, or, or supporting existing resources management structures, such as the land commissions. As you know, land issues are, are, are you know, uh, you know, are managed by uh, local institutions that have been put in place by the, the government, known as COFO, Commission Française or Land Commissions, or water councils that are important relay information. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, that was uh, really informative, a lot of information, but you made it clear how important it is um, to enhance this, this trust building among stakeholders uh, and to make interventions conflict sensitive and how tools also can use to make things transparent, but also well informed for this reason. Now, also for your presentation, we have a poll and I'd like to present the poll before we go to the questions. Um, which key elements would you include in an integrated intervention to curb violence in Mali? This is a big question. <laughs> um, so which key elements would you include to curb violence in Mali? Would it be strengthening military cooperation to answer security threats? Investment in wetland ecosystem restoration? Support to sustainable agriculture and prosperous livelihood systems? or ensure the implementation of inclusive and fair tenure and resource use legislation and plans. Well, please um, read it again and give your votes. We're really curious what you think is the best way. And in between while you're voting, we'll already be taking uh, some questions. Um, um, so please also you can put your questions in Slido and refer them to us. We have a little time, we're a little bit out of time, so we have a little time to discuss those questions. And to begin, um, I think it's good to, to look at all three presentations for your questions. And I'm wondering, um, Liz, you said you want to improve your forecast with causalities. Is that possible? And, and can you already see some causalities? I'm really curious with the data, if um, you can see what is actually causing in a certain situation the tension, or is that not yet possible? Sure, so we're still in progress. So um, we're, we're very much you know, in the weeds right now, um, but our partners from the Hague Center for Strategic Studies are actually working on that right now. Um, we're primarily focusing on um, how SPI, or the Standardized Precipitation Index, relates to conflict issues. Um, so if there's you know, more or less water than, than usual, is that something that can uh, result in a, in a causation? Um, so not definitive yet, but very much a work in progress, and I will get back to you soon on that. OK, well, really curious to hear more about that when that is uh, happening. And I think many of you are casting your vote now. I'll give you a little bit more time. Um, but uh, many people have already put their votes. Um, so let's look at one more thing. Um, Umar, you said you have some EU recommendations. I'm really curious about that one. Um, and you turned about conflict, sensitive, uh, conflict sensitivity of EU interventions. What are you thinking about? What kind of interventions? Where could the EU actually play a role in making their work more conflict sensitive? Uh, it, it depends on the, the action, but of course, uh, whether it's uh, humanitarian or it's uh, peace building or it's uh, development uh, interventions, uh, I mean, they, they have to be really conflict sensitive. This is uh, the, the reason why we do uh, provide that capacity building to, uh, you know, a large network of uh, local partners as well as international organizations. So we, we need to make sure that the intervention, the, you know, the investments do not also cause harm to communities uh, that we primarily target. Okay, thank you. So that is important that when the EU is investing, they make sure that this is taken into account. So please, everybody in the audience, think about that. Then I'd like to go to our poll. Um, I think we can close it now. And I'm really curious what is coming out. Can you give the votes? So it's like Eurovision Song Festival. Um, so we can see that most people feel that ensure the implementation of inclusive and fair tenure and resource use legislation and plans is um, most important. And this, I think, relates well to what um, Aaron said about um, the 
immense importance about institutions to actually deal with conflicts rather than what is behind it uh, pushing it. Um, but there's also a lot of support for support to sustainable agriculture and pastoralist livelihood systems, so to make people more resilient, um, and investment in ecosystems. And defense, there's no defense in this uh, audience. Um, people feel that military cooperation is not the best answer to security threats. So that also is an interesting uh, outcome if you look at how actually we are dealing with security threats in Mali at the moment. I don't know, Omar, if you have any response to those outcomes. What do you think? Uh, about the security threats? Yeah, well, about the response of people. Would you... Uh, would you feel this yeah. is also the kind of response that you would give yourself? Yes, absolutely. I think it's really, it's really important to support the implementation of the existing legislation and plans that are, that are in place. But more importantly, we, we, we really need to invest also um, on, on ecosystems uh, preservation and restoration because this is also uh, really important. We know, for example, like the Inner Niger, Niger Delta, which is a very huge uh, you know, wetlands. I would say, as I said in my uh, presentation, it's even the biggest wetlands in, um, um, uh, you know, across West Africa. Okay. So we really need to invest uh, on preserving and, and, you know, conflicts around that and make sure that, you know, the resources are used in a, in a very equitable and, and inclusive manner. Okay. Now, we're, time is flying, so we, I think we have time for one question from the audience. And they're asking, um, can you elaborate on how you take the global warning tool to local action? How do you understand the conflict that's being flagged? So uh, Liz, I think you can give some suggestion. You already said we need further analysis. Exactly. So yeah, with the, the global early warning tool, it's, um, you know, a, uh, a high level just flagging of risk. And then from there, what we encourage people to do is go onto our global tool and to look at those data sets that might provide more contextual information. But um, from there, you really need to get local. And the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership has a, uh, a whole um, goal and program of local analysis where we look at, um, at hydrological models on the ground, and we work with stakeholders on the ground to actually understand what's happening. So if you're interested in a certain location, I definitely encourage you to get in touch with uh, the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership um, and to work with us to do that local analysis. Okay, thank you. And uh, for the audience, if you have more questions, please put them up now on Slido. And you can also like a question that you see from someone else if you think that's exactly what I wanted to ask, then you don't have to put it again. And I'd like to go to our next question. Um, someone asked, do you also help countries or stakeholders to improve their capacity on water conflicts? And how can we learn more? Aaron, maybe uh, you're also involved in water peace and security in terms of uh, capacity building at IHE Delft. Maybe you can say something more about this. Thanks, uh, Ronin, and it's a, it's a great question. I think a, a lot of um, a lot of regions in the world are are already taking the lead in in water diplomacy. Again, at the international scale, uh, certainly Southern Africa has some of the richest uh, institutions. Uh, between the the countries of the SADC region, uh, the Mekong River Commission is a is a model that people use all over the world, and so I think a lot of the learning really is more south south. Uh, but if if we're we're focusing on the European uh, experience, a number of European countries also have have really taken the lead in in trying to help uh, precisely in this area of capacity building uh, in early warning and in uh, diplomacy. Uh, the, the, certainly the, the Swiss, uh, the Dutch, the Germans um, the, um, are all have very, very active programs, uh, fortunately working mostly uh, cooperatively, uh, which is which is very helpful. I think I think the real key is to when we're looking at, at how capacity building is done, um, Oftentimes, I think a, a northern approach is to bring a solution or to bring an answer, and that's usually not the most effective thing. The answers are already there. The solutions are already there. 
what often is, is useful is a process. And uh, that's the part that I think uh, really can be, um, as I said, er, uh, better conversations earlier. And then if you're looking, for example, to build a model of a basin, uh, you offer the opportunity to build it cooperatively, to mm. enhance the relations as you're developing the solution. So actually, um doing all at the same time, working together on the analysis and building the model, and at the same time building each other's capacity in understanding what is going on and what needs to happen. And starting a dialogue, because if you build, involve everybody, you can also dialogue. Umar, maybe um, in, in your program, are you also working on building capacity of communities in this sense? Yes, absolutely. We also provide uh, capacity building to uh, target communities, um, in, in, uh, specifically on, in, on conflict and gender sensitivity, on conflict resolution, and uh, also, you know, how to put community members together around an inclusive dialogue uh, pertaining to peace and security, and also, you know, around the, 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 the you know the, the importance of the ecosystems and, and the water restoration um, you know ecosystems so we we provide capacity building yes and then we, we engage with the communities into discussions around uh, peace and security okay thank you I don't see any new questions coming in if you have questions maybe we can still fit them in um, but otherwise um, we can uh, start rounding off this discussion. Um, maybe for the speakers, if you have one last uh, advice for the audience, especially at the uh, EU, um, who is kindly hosting us today, um, what you think should be a priority uh, to prevent uh, security threats and escalation into conflicts. Um, Aaron, anything, any thought? Uh, well, uh, sure. As, as I said, I think, I think the, the the key point for the uh, development partners is not just to think about a technical solution, but to think about a process that brings people together in dialogue, uh, that, that creates uh, and enhances and bolsters institutions that can then uh, enhance the resilience of both communities and countries and, and basins as a whole. I think that really is the, uh, uh, the key lesson that, that I've come out from, from my experiences. Okay. Um, so, yes, enhancing dialogue, enhancing capacities, um, and making sure people can manage water resources and water resources related security threats, um, which prevents them going out of hand. And I think I see Chris approaching me already uh, on the sideline, so I think we're about uh, um, at the end of our session. I don't, um, I don't need to pull you off. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but I think uh, what's important is we're a bit, you know, we. The main points of this are what? I mean, it's very interesting that we have this, this, this early warning tool. Yeah. It's, it's, it could perhaps prevent future conflicts. Is that right? Well, definitely. I think if people really, you know, every quarter we give an update where we see tensions are rising. And we really want uh, decision makers, um, as much as people working on the ground, to look at that and, and s come together and say, how can we prevent it? Because often, especially because it's so special that the warning tool also gives new conflicts that haven't come up again. Yeah. And it's much easier to prevent it if you come in early than if you wait until it has been I, uh, escalated. Yeah. I've, I've covered conflicts, a number of conflicts, yeah. in the Middle East, in Africa, in the Balkans, and there was always that feeling of, why did this have to happen? Yeah. Couldn't we have prevented this? Yeah. So this was a really good discussion for them. Well, thank you. And conflict is always more expensive than peace. Absolutely. So let's not, uh, um, you know, spend our money badly, but yeah. act early. I see all these nodding heads. Thanks so much for the speakers as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for EDD for hosting us and allowing us to speak here. And uh, Liz, Aaron, and Umar, thank you for joining. Great. And, and Rolene, thank and you, you too. as well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So let's wrap this up, this part, but we still have more. Uh, we will come back shortly, and I'll have an interview with that young leader, uh, the young leader from Honduras, Ricardo Pineda. We're going to talk a little bit more about what he's doing in Honduras to try to prevent conflicts and try to develop water safety and quality. We'll be right back.